Futures Radio Show, sponsored by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world effectively manage risk. For access to free educational tools and resources for the active individual trader, please visit activetrader.cmegroup.com. Com. Every day, traders and investors dive in to tackle the ever-changing markets to find opportunity. Futures Radio Show is your number one source for answers to the questions that all market participants want to ask. Veteran futures trader Anthony Crudelli sits down with the most influential leaders and top traders in the industry. Now, here's your host, Anthony Crudelli. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in for this episode with Dr. Richard Sandor. Remember, new shows are posted on Mondays and Thursdays. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes and YouTube. If you're enjoying the show, please leave a review on iTunes. Before I play today's interview for you, I want to give a shout out to the great sponsors of Futures Radio Show. CME Group, Trading Technologies, FTSE Russell, RJO Futures, and Top Step Trader. To learn more about these sponsors and the important things they are doing for futures traders, be sure to click on their logos on our website. Today, I spoke with the chairman and CEO of the American Financial Exchange, Dr. Richard Sandor. Dr. Sandor is a legend in the futures industry. He is recognized as the father of financial futures as he helped develop the first interest rate futures contract. We talked about how he got involved in futures developed financial and environmental futures contracts, and created the 30-year bond. We discussed the recent launch of Ameribor Futures. And last but not least, Dr. Sandor tells us what he believes is the next game changer in financial markets. So without further ado, let me take you right to the interview with Dr. Sandor. Dr. Sandor, how did you get involved in futures markets? Um, <laughs> more or less uh, fortuity. Uh, I was teaching at the University of California at Berkeley in the late 60s, and uh, I was trading equities at the time. It was, you know, the birth of Silicon Valley, and that was going well, so... I decided, based on the advice of a colleague, to start trading futures. Um, I read up on them, did all of the necessary academic world, and started uh, trading. What years did you start working with the exchanges in Chicago? After I was uh, involved in trading futures, I got a approached by uh, the Commodity Club of San Francisco, uh, who asked me, uh, given that I had technical background and expertise and also knew about commodity trading, uh, would I design a industrial structure for a new exchange? The idea was that it would be a for-profit exchange and electronic. And so um, I knew a little bit about that, and I started, uh, I got a grant from the Bank of America, uh, started a research project, and started visiting Chicago because I had to understand the mechanics of pit trading to develop the algorithms for an all-electronic system. It was pretty radical at the time. There were no for-profit exchanges. The PC had not been invented. Um, I worked uh, with a colleague from electrical engineering and computer sciences, and we put together um, the infrastructure for that new exchange. And that story is recounted in a book that I just wrote about a year ago called From Electronic Trading to the Blockchain. And the original study is there. It, it 
subsequently predated the Wagner patent where there were lots of lawsuits about it and and the book contains an article from the FT in 1970 saying there's this curious academic who thinks exchanges will be for profit and all electronics. So in 1970, that was pretty radical. That's 50 years ago. Yeah, I would say so. Uh, now, we're going to definitely talk about some of the financial futures contracts that you created. But I'm, I'm curious, before you went to Chicago and you said that you started to trade futures in the 60s, what products were you trading then? I was trading uh, beans and bellies. <laughs> beans and bellies. <laughs> Those were the two most widely traded products uh, at the time. So... Um, it was uh, seemed obvious that that ought to be what I should focus on. Were you using charts, fundamentals? What was your strategy? Actually, I was developing uh, computerized models, which were trend following systems and wrote about that, I think, in a 1970 article in Commodities Magazine, how computerized trading uh, would ultimately be most important. Remember, in, this is, you know, I'm 700 years old, and so, you know, 50 <laughs> years ago, <laughs> it was a very different world. And, and actually, as a segue, into our discussion on financial futures. In 69, there was a credit crunch in California. And um, California at the time was like an undeveloped country. Interest rates were 1% higher than the rest of the company because housing was being built in the West, but the money was in the East Coast savings banks. I looked uh, around and said uh, there, there should be a mortgage futures market because, you know, this is why can't you trade money, um, even though everything was agricultural. And so I ultimately got the whole, a hold of a 18,000 loan portfolio at Citizen Saving and and loan association analyzed it, try to create a homogeneous instrument. But it turned out the statistical analysis suggested there were a lot of non-quantifiable determinants of mortgage interest rates. There was redlining in those days if you were a single woman with children, all things that, that mortgages were not being issued to certain classes of borrowers. So while loan-to-value ratio, personal income were important, these dummy variables turned out to be very important. Um, fortuitously, uh, the Government started Ginny May um, in 1970, and I realized this was the solution. As a result of the travels back and forth to Chicago to learn the market, uh, I had met a, quite a few people in the industry. Uh, the Board of Trade then hired John F. Kennedy's liaison with Congress, a man by the name of Henry Hall Wilson, to really modernize the Chicago Board of Trade, which at that point was the world's largest uh, commodity exchange. And so he had been enamored um, by the role of economists that JFK uh, had provided. He was a big leader, understood it, and uh, I had got my PhD at the University of Minnesota, and Walter Heller, who was JFK's advisor, taught there, so uh, we knew some people in common. I flew out there. 
Uh, they offered the job. I said I was happy teaching at Berkeley. <laughs> it was a lot of fun um, and uh, was interested in the job, but only on a sabbatical basis. After going back and forth, uh, they agreed, and, and so I took a sabbatical and started working in early 1972 for the exchange. One of the conditions of employment uh, verbally, uh, but well understood, that I would conduct research into interest rate futures contracts. And I would also do research on what I thought was going to be very important, and that is catastrophe derivatives. And I, I at that time, thought they were pretty much both offered tremendous opportunities. Uh, I got to Chicago. I kept on doing the research. Interest rates were quiescent. Um, the government didn't issue long bonds at that stage. But then in April, in, in 1973, we had a series of, of developments which I think changed the world and set the stage for the birth of a new definition of a commodity. And what had happened was the, it was late plantings in the crops, a hot summer, an early frost, the uh, failures of Russian crops, failure in Chinese crops, the Peru, the anchovies stop running off the coast of Peru, and the Arab oil embargo. So all commodities hit record levels, interest rates became volatile, and all of a sudden uh, the, those people among the dealer community and among my fellow economists and members of the exchange woke up and said, uh-oh, this looks like it could be real. There was a moment of coincidence because at that time, people blamed the Chicago speculators for causing the price increases associated with food. And it became clear that there was going to be regulation of futures. Um, I was the chief economist of the exchange. Phil Johnson was the counsel. Um, and we sat down with Henry Hall Wilson and said, look, this is, don't, we shouldn't fight this. Um, it's going to happen, and what's important is that we redefine what a commodity is so that we could trade financial instruments, number one. And number two, so there was unambiguous regulatory jurisdiction that the CFTC be the exclusive regulator for anything that had futures associated with it. Um, and uh, 73 came to an end. I called the dean and said, I need another year. <laughs> it looks like this thing is going to take off. And then worked on the legislation, worked with the, the, the House, uh, John Rainbolt, and ultimately the ultimate decision maker regarding exclusive definition, exclusive jurisdiction, was the Senate Ag Committee, who was chaired by Herman Talmadge. And I had gotten to know Mike McLeod, who was his chief of staff, and we had worked together. And so the final bill came out. Um, it became clear at the end of 74 that I either had to go back to Berkeley or resign. I called the dean. He said, you can't have another year. And I was all in on this whole notion of financial futures. So I resigned. And uh, the first, the oddity of it all is the first submission to the new Commodity Futures Trading Commission wasn't a commodity.
It was a fixed income security, the Ginny May. So the irony was that the name of the commission was commodity, and all of the commodities that grew out of that um, work from there. That led to um, a buildup in the government's decision to issue long-term debt, which we thought was coming, and so we wrote a futures contract on a 30-year treasury. It, um, and ultimately, uh, we designed the contract, including the cheapest to deliver, because there wasn't a lot of supply. It also fit the grain markets, um, and like Ginny Mays, it was opposed, and everybody said, ah, interest rates had gone flat. It's a dumb idea. Go back to Chicago. We don't have any need to hedge interest rates. And uh, 50 years ago, 42 years ago, this weekend, coincidentally, the opening of Ameribor Future, coincidental, it's uh, an homage to my uh, mentor and friend, Les Rosenthal. We cut the ribbon on long bonds. Uh, 42 years ago, and it's now the oldest derivative and most widely imitated uh, around the world. It's an amazing story. Thank you so much for sharing it. Can you give us a little bit more insight into the process and the details that went into creating the 30-year bond? I'm just wondering how you decided the tick size and you know, I, I really just everything that went into developing that contract? Well, it, it, it really followed the Ginny May, and that was um, the model for the design of the bond contract. Okay. We went through several iterations, you know, should it be, you know, 250,000, 500, what should be the size of the contract, and, and ultimately we designed it so that it would have similar movements in value to the physical commodities. And that was really the driver. You know, exchanges and, and competed with each other to keep margin requirements comparable, and you needed to have a, a contract whose size and margin were competitive enough with the grains and the metals uh, to compete for the speculative dollar. It wasn't driven by the commercials because the commercials always could trade a multiple. While that was a million dollar round number at the point, the 100,000 was chosen to compete for speculative capital. We knew the dealers would trade and they could understand. The same with the tick size of a 32nd. You know, it was basically um, patterned so that market makers could make money by buying a bid and selling an offer and make the tick as market makers. So, you had to design the size of the contract, the method of delivery, as well as the tick size to compete with market makers and, and whatnot. So we had those with the design issues. We also set the hours so that they would open before the grain markets open and close after, so we'd get people trailing into the pits to do that. Um, and uh, we designed the cheapest to deliver because it followed the grain markets and in terms of optionality, when you write or invent a futures contract, the requirement is that it gave whatever optionality there was to the seller because the seller would ultimately control the supply. So it's the cheapest to deliver, 
the late deliveries, you put as much optionality in the contract for the seller to maximize their participation and their liquidity. Hey everybody, I want to take a moment to thank one of our sponsors, FTSE Russell. They are a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. The Russell 2000 Index is a key benchmark for small cap U.S. stocks. Be sure to check out the E-mini Russell 2000 Index Futures, contract symbol RTY. For more information on FTSE Russell and their products, please visit FTSERussell.com. I want to move on and talk about environmental futures contracts because you, you actually, um, we have a lot of intra, we have a lot of energy traders on here as well. And talk to us about you getting involved with carbon credits and some environmental futures markets. Sure. Um, <laughs> it's really a good segue from um, the inventing I did both domestically and then starting to help Life and, and Matif on their financial markets. I operated in the business for a while, ran derivatives and fixed income shops um, and uh, during the 80s. And, uh, and in 1989, I was approached by uh, a uh, trade association that was in the business of selling lime. And, um, and the folks approached me and said, look, you commoditize money. Um, could you commoditize air? And I said, sure. As a matter of fact, it's really, uh, <laughs> it, it's conceptually no different. And they said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, there's a rich theoretical history and actually a mentor of, and friend of mine, Ronald Coase, who subsequently won the Nobel Prize for an article entitled The Theory of Social Costs outlined how trading might accomplish environmental objectives. Um, and I undertook, did a study for them, worked on, on, on ensuring that trading got into the Clean Air Act of 1990. And, um, we work with Bill Riley, who was uh, then head of the EPA in designing the model and clarifying legislation that didn't require utilities to have continuous emission monitors. And we served on the Asset Written Advisory Committee. I, sub I had, in the, in the meantime, formed my own firm, um, which was the predecessor to environmental financial products, and uh, we arranged and actually did the first trade in the acid rain program. And for those people that trade, it really wasn't a trade, it was a financing. Um, we had a utility that had to build a, a scrubber, which is how you take um, sulfur out of a flue gas and you mix it with lime. That's why the lime producers wanted the act. And you pass it through this sludge and that scrubber, you know, is cleaning a smokestack, but it's actually a chemical factory. It might cost 50 to 100 million per stack to build. So we approached a utility that was building a scrubber and that they were you know, leveraging themselves and having to pay interim construction costs to build the plant, uh, suggested to them that there was a better way to finance this scrubber. And they said, what? And we said, look, over the next 30 years, you're gonna be under your cap. And therefore you'll be able to sell the rights to emit sulfur. And I'll present value 30 years of your 
um, reductions and I'll find a, a ultimately warehouse them and then find a buyer by somebody who couldn't build a scrubber because they didn't have enough land. And so we present valued uh, the 30 years of emissions reductions. I think it was a 40 or $50 million trade. And then we sold it to a utility, attached it to a zero coupon bond and financed them. So uh, the first environmental trading wasn't really trading. It was a financing. It's all very interesting to, uh, to me. Um, what... the, the, the next step was, just to give you full flavor, in 1991, I got approached by the United Nations and said, look, we're going to have a conference in Rio, you know, um, in 1992, and there's a summit, and, you know, this is gonna, we think there's a problem with global warming coming, and you commoditize money and you commoditize sulfur, can you commoditize carbon? And I said, sure. And so uh, I flew to Geneva uh, for a day and uh, spent some time with a group of folks from the United Nations and some economists. And I said, this is how you do it. They said, great. Um, and I delivered a paper in Rio in 1992 called In Search of Trees and outlined the architecture for worldwide carbon markets. Um, fast forward, somebody came to me who was ultimately the um, the chairman of the Rio Summit, a guy by the name of Maurice Strong, a Canadian, and he introduced me to some Costa Rican folks, and I, uh, they said, well, we're going to put this land into rainforest. Can you securitize the rainforest? My third answer was, sure. <laughs> and so, yeah. so we sold carbon credits. Um, um, and we found some buyers for them, and we personally principled the trade and bought some carbon trade uh, credits for preserving rainforests in Costa Rica. Things went along, uh, and we thought an act was coming, and somewhere there would be cap and trade in in carbon, and so we started a venture with Maurice, which was to get a market off the ground earlier. As a result, uh, we got invited to Kyoto um, and to caught the attention of Al Gore and, and Bill Clinton, <clears throat> gave several papers in Kyoto, and then in 2000, 2001, it became clear that the U.S. wasn't going to act, and we decided, let's see if we can get a voluntary market going. So we established the Chicago Climate Exchange um, and raised some capital um, to finance us. We developed a, a system that would domestically require people to curb their emissions by commercial contract and not by law. And then if they cut their carbon by more than their targeted amount, they could sell them to others. And we were pretty successful with that. Um, we ultimately had 108 emitters, uh, names like Ford, DuPont, uh, Motorola, you know, leading uh, cities like Chicago, states like New Mexico, uh, power companies. So we had 25% of the American power sector and 11% of all industrial companies in America. Um, ultimately, if it was a country, it would have been the size of Germany. We did the same thing in Europe um, because they passed the law, established an exchange there to administer the or 
European Union Emissions Trading System um, and began that. Uh, ultimately, we sought and started educating the Chinese to what cap and trade was. And I think it was 2006. Again, I had a presentation at a UN seminar and said, this is something that you um, need to address. Became partners with the biggest company in China, CNPC, the Chinese National Petroleum Corporation, known to your listeners as PetroChina, the biggest company in China. We established the first climate exchange in China. I became a, an honorary professor and, and lectured at Peking University in the Guangwan School of Management. Whatever we've invented, I always taught concomitantly. So I taught the first course in derivatives at Northwestern in 74 and held a, a chair there. We uh, financed a lot of the uh, carbon research through the Joyce Foundation and it was administered by Northwestern University. And uh, now I happen to be the Aaron Director, Lecturer in Law and Economics, and I teach a course in Environmental Markets. So we always consider we have to educate the press, educate the graduate students, educate the academic world, build and exchange all of the institutions, decide about trading platforms and electronic design the contracts, all in mind to minimize transaction costs. In 2010, um, I was on the, the uh, board of ICE, the founding members, before it went public. We used them as our technology provider and I left the board uh, so that I could negotiate them with arm's length. We sold the Chicago Climate Exchange to ICE in 2010 for $600 million. Our investors made seven and a half to 15 times their money. Um, and we left a legacy. And as a matter of fact, to all the traders out there, I think you'll be surprised the legacy is that North American carbon markets, who everybody thinks is dead, is uh, not reading the numbers and reading the headlines instead. If you consider Reggie, which ICE now runs, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative for the 10 states, if you look at the California cap and trade, if you look at renewable energy uh, contracts, the open interest in Northern American carbon is $700,000. It is bigger than the open interest in gold. And I don't think anybody wow. realizes what's going on in that market. So. The legacy continues in those markets. In 2011, um, I went to uh, sold the exchange, went to visit my kids and grandkids in Atlanta. Then I went to visit the other kids and grandkids in LA. Then I went down to Panama with my wife to see some of her friends. And after about six weeks, my wife gently suggested maybe it was time for me to go back to work. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and, and so I'm a restless soul, reformulated environmental financial products, and said, let's find a new market. I was enamored by water. We had a contract with the state of New Mexico. We got a grant to preserve the Great Lakes from a Chicago Joyce Foundation. We were working with California and China. And then I read in the FT that the Royal Bank of Scotland fired four traders for manipulating LIBOR. I called in the team said, let's put water on the back burner. We'll do that next. 
Uh, but we have a 10-year project here, and, and the project was premised on three things. Ultimately, LIBOR would lose its preeminence. Interest rates at zero were not sustainable. That a, a London poll, you know, was not the way to do it. That we, America, being the largest an economy in the world, needed its own benchmark. And the Fed would ultimately stop borrowing money at the levels it did because its role when it was founded and subsequent to its founding and all the way up to 2007 and eight was a lender, not a borrower. And so we figured that would be a change. My life changed dramatically, uh, Anthony, instead of going to London, Paris, Shanghai, New York, L.A., I found myself in Tupelo, Mississippi, Bentonville, <laughs> um, Arkansas, San Antonio, Texas, Memphis, Kansas City, Green Bay. I can tell your viewers where the best pulled pork is in America. <laughs> So, anyway, I've eaten more ribs, brisket, <laughs> collard greens, chicken than you can imagine. Uh, we started getting traction. People, like said, go back to Chicago. But I'd heard that for 40 years, that these were never a reality. LIBOR is never going to go away. Interest rates are always going to be zero. I'm a contrarian just made me more determined in 2014. We got some wind in our sails, and uh, the Fed formed the Alternative Rates Committee, and people said, ah, maybe this is not such a crazy idea. Approached the SIBO in 2015, said to them, you, if you want to compete, you know, and have a full suite of, of products, you need interest rates. I'll develop the cash market, and then you can trade futures and options and create ETFs and ETNs, and uh, we would make a good partners because I want to run a virtual exchange like the climate exchange. I want to outsource compliance. I want a regulated market, one that's transparent, no spoofing, a 100-page rule book, et cetera. And we're going to do what we've done before, build a consensus that this would be a good idea. They agreed. We went to Washington, briefed the Fed, the OCC, the FDIC, the SEC, the CFTC got uh, and loans uh, were not a security or commodity, so it was going to be a cash market for overnight lending and unsecured uh, kind of a peer-to-peer -peer fintech platform. We launched uh, in uh, December 11, 2015. Uh, we had four banks at the opening, um, and the biggest bank in Wisconsin, Associated, the biggest in Indiana, Old National, biggest independent uh, in Texas, Frost Bank, and MB here in Chicago. We traded $13 million a day. And in the last three and a half years, we built up critical mass. So we have 127 banks now, plus a thousand community banks through our correspondence. So we have 1,127 banks, about 20% of America's banks. The uh, non-community banks have. Co Combined assets of 1.9 trillion, so about 12% of all the banking assets. And volume in the second quarter went from 13 million a day when we opened to 1.8 billion a day, which made us have sufficient gravitas to get designation for the CFTC. We have two contracts that are traded uh, seven day, which is meant to hedge 
liquidity requirements under the Federal Reserve Board's 2900, where you as a bank have to have a certain amount of liquidity, and the bank, the Fed tells you what it is. So if you borrow, you can hedge the rate, and it's a weekly contract, not a monthly, because you can hedge for two weeks in a row. Every other Wednesday, the Fed gives you your liquidity for the next two weeks. So that is meant to be a hedging tool, which is the history of all of the markets. We first look to what the hedgers want. And we designed it, uh, again, in the same thing. It's an $18 million contract, you know, and it's designed to be competitive, you know, with, with size of contract, size of tick, all of the things that we learned from treasury bonds, the carbon of a 1,000 tons. We used our expertise, and then we came up with a 90-day uh, futures based on Ameribor, the spot market, um, and uh, we will ultimately go out the yield curve, um, and uh, we have a cash market in 30 days, we'll do one in 90 days, and we're going to build out the curve. Um, and so that's my story, Anthony, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I could listen to you talk about the history of these of developing financial and environmental futures all day long. I, I, I want to close out with um, I have two more questions. The first one is obviously we know your history, and you've always been. Ahead I'm of the sorry curve. for your trouble. I'm sorry for your troubles. <laughs> <laughs> If you know my history, yeah. oh, well, we know your history on the on the financial and environmental future stuff. So let's. I want to talk about just give us. I know you've given us some details already about the Amirabor futures contract, but just talk to us about um, some more specifics. I know it's going to be launched on August sixteenth. Uh, just if you could just give us a few more details. Well, you know, August 16th wasn't uh, picked at random. Um, it is the 42nd anniversary of the Long Bond Futures launch, and it's an homage to my dear friend and teacher who I cut the ribbon with 42 years ago, Les Rosenthal. So that's why we chose the date. Okay. And you will find it amusing shortly after the launch of bond futures. A little luck and humor always plays a role. The government issued the 7 and 7 eighths of 2007, which affectionately became known as the James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 007. So, you know, I kind of, like most traders, I'm a little superstitious so you know you you throw in a little superstition and you get uh, you know something like that I love it um, you've seen so much over the years you've always been ahead of the curve what's one thing happening now or maybe that's not happening yet that you believe will be a game changer in financial markets Oh, I think we're working on a game changer. You know, everybody who is not a student, and, and not everybody, but most people think that there's going to be a replacement of LIBOR. As a student of the market and having experiences both a inventor and a user, LIBOR was the total exception to the rule. If you take a look at every other asset class, you don't have one benchmark. So in crude oil, you've got WTI, Brent, Dubai, Shanghai. You have more stock indexes than you have stocks. And you have more fixed income indexes than you have sovereigns. And and it's our hypothesis, and it's already happening with a British benchmark similar to Sulphur, 
Um, and it's happening in Tokyo. Canada is announcing we're going to have a family of interest rate benchmarks, and this is going to transform uh, amazingly. We have a great product with SOFR, the Fed Designed Index. It serves the, the big uh, money center banks. We think we have a terrific product that services uh, the uh, other banks uh, who don't own government securities and they need a benchmark and there's 5,000 of them out there who don't own governments um, and therefore SOFR is not appropriate as a way to match assets and liabilities. So I think that is, is very much in hand. And, uh, and so I think that the transformation and transition from LIBOR to other, a multiplicity of individual interest rates is going to be the biggest event between now and 2025. Very interesting. What can I say, Dr. Sander? This was awesome, but we are not done yet. I have some rapid fire questions next if you're ready for those. Go shoot it, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Next up on our rapid fire segment is sponsored by Trading Technologies. Trade the global markets with TT. They are the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. Now with integrated tools for advanced options trading, cryptocurrencies, and trade surveillance. Try it now, free at tryttnow.com. Dr. Sandor, what trader has influenced your life the most and why? That's a very difficult question to answer. And, and let me quickly say that that Certainly, Les Rosenthal did. Uh, there are other guys uh, whose names are in uh, Chicago's early history. Uh, Billy and Eddie O'Connor, who were close friends, uh, were fabulous. Um, Hank Shatkin, another one, Lee Stern, uh, you know. There's a number of old names in this uh, industry uh, that reflect the personalities of the men who worked in wooden pits. These were iron men in wooden pits. And, and the O'Connors, the Goldberg brothers, you know, uh, all were unique people at a unique point in town. What was one of the hardest things that you'd had to overcome in your career? I couldn't get the hand signals right in the pit. <laughs> <laughs> and so they would all yell at me, Doc, get the hand signals. Hands in means buy, hands out means sell. And so my trading badge became Doc. Uh, kind of, I figured if everybody is is pointing their fingers and laughing, I would rather be part of the joke than an object of it. So I have then worn proudly my badge, Doc, uh, in all of the exchanges uh, that I've been a member or board of, from the CME to Life to the Border Trade. So that's my hardest challenge, and I ultimately <laughs> overcame it. <laughs> How has your process for innovation evolved over the years? Uh, it's basically the, the process is not any different. The, there's a well, and, and it's written in good derivatives, and it's written in the four or five other books the that I've written, the, you know, there's a well-known seven-stage process, which is not a good subject for this interview, but the key is, is to recognize some structural change. Recognize that acid rain would get prevalent, recognize that interest rates, recognize that, that you know, 07, 08, or LIBOR, you know, you have to get the big picture, 
And you have to look, as Gordy Howe said, you got to skate where the puck's going, not where it's been. And so anytime we start a market, we imagine what the world would be like in, in 10 to 20 years and put all of our focus on that. Um, and, you know, we've gotten some things right and a lot of things wrong, but what we always are cued by is this a transformational time? And if it is, spend the next decade making it happen. What is one attribute that you believe every trader should have? Three attributes from uh, my mentors. Discipline, discipline, and discipline. Favorite book about markets? Not really anything that, that I would single out. Most of them are fun. I've read the histories and contributed to the history of the border trade, the CME, you know. I, I'm a, a student, and so I, it's like kids. You don't have favorites. I'm familiar with most of the events of our times, so I enjoy reading about others' viewpoints of it. If you had to pick one profession besides what you've done over the years, what would you do? I would have been and I wanted to be an architect. And I guess I ended up being a financial <laughs> architect. But I, yep. uh, if, I, if the courses and, uh, were available and, and the resources, I would have been a, an architect and a civil engineer. I, I like building and I guess I came as close to it in, as an economist, uh, but I would have really enjoyed being an architect. What's the best piece of advice that you received about trading? Be disciplined. And, and uh, recognize and always ask yourself, always, if there's a reason that you're making money. Okay, one has to remember constantly that what value are you providing? Are you buying breaks and therefore providing liquidity? Are you providing uh, liquidity to new markets? What are the things and toolkits that you know? You know, whether you are a long-term or a short-term trader and be disciplined about it. I, I think I... Not I think. I wrote a, before I joined the Board of Trade, a pamphlet which is 50 years old called Speculation, and I lay out a group of rules about that at that time. If we can find it, uh, we'll get you a copy. Thank you so much. If you could go back in time and give the younger you a piece of advice, what would you say? I don't, you know, a very hard question to ask. The, you know, I, you know, I, I guess I would have been said to myself, be less nervous um, uh, when you embrace change. I would have liked to, you know, known that because I constantly embrace change and I teach that to people that if there's a singular message is, um, is to embrace change. Um, if I could have, I wish I would have done it with less anxiety. <laughs> you know, but I, uh, but I, I love change and participating in it. And uh, in retrospect, uh, wish I had done it with more equanimity. Um, uh, but uh, I think the message to your listeners: change is your friend. Last question for today. 
What's your favorite thing to do when you're not working? Uh, art. Um, I'm obsessive compulsive and we collect photography and my wife is, does virtual reality and uh, we really enjoy uh, art. Uh, she is the artist, I am the collector and we have thousands of fine art photographs uh, all over my office, my home, uh, etc. And I love to learn. And photography, we got into it because she went got, got an MFA at the Art Institute, Ellen Sandor, and she turned me on to her advisor and suggested we do it so i did what i do in work i compulsively dove into it and loved the field and thought it was basically overlooked and neglected and so i've spent with her 40 years of collecting photographs that's awesome where can people find you on social media and give us a website to check out um, the social media is that we're on Twitter, and Laura can uh, give that to you. And I, I think uh, we are uh, a mirrorboard.net. Um, and uh, if you Google uh, Sandor Family Collection, you can see the art. <laughs> and the, the, the twin there. The Twitter handle is uh, at the AFX. Dr. Sander, what can I say? Thank you so Anthony, much. Anthony, you, you've, been, you've been fun, and thank you very much. And I, I hope that your readers can learn something from this. And if they can't, I hope it's a good sleep aid. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for coming on Futures Radio Show today. My pleasure. Take care. Bye. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you have any questions or comments for myself or my guests, please visit futuresradioshow.com and sign up to be a premium member for free. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes.